Is perfection impossible? When nobody can be perfect. You're asking for too much, they say. You can't be perfect. And yet, when you study the Word of God, in no place does He even suggest to us the impossibility of perfection. Can I be perfect? Can I do things perfectly? Now, don't let anybody cheat you out of God's best and tell you that you don't have to be perfect. Well, the Word of God says to be. How do I know that I am perfect? Perfection is measured according to light, according to instruction, according to information. One thing is certain. If you stick to the Word, you will come back with a testimony. What God wants to give you in your life is not a healing. What God wants to give you in your life is not a job. What God wants to give you in your life is not money. What God wants to give you is the Word of God in your spirit. It will make you what it talks about. And you are shining. And you are shining by the power of the Holy Ghost. You are shining by the power of the Holy Ghost. You are shining and nothing can stop you. It is your season. It is your time. Nothing can hinder you. This is your time. This is your hour. Favor is yours. The number one thing that you're going to have to comprehend and apprehend for your absolute success is perfection. 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 It's one of those things that people don't like to talk about. They, they don't like it because did you ever hear people say, nobody is perfect? Did you ever hear that? And everybody agrees. The moment it's said, I mean, you know, a lot of preachers say that, and they say, oh, no one is perfect. And then they say, are you perfect? And they go, no. The preacher says, oh, I'm not perfect either, so none of us is perfect. And so they all are very happy because, you know, no one is perfect. So... Um, and then they say, we're all striving towards perfection. When are we going to get there? And say, well, when we get there, Jesus comes. Oh, you mean the day Jesus will come, the whole church will just suddenly be perfect at that moment? Is it a moment of perfection for everybody? What kind of perfection will that be then? I think that there will be some people who are just giving their lives to Christ at the time Jesus shows up. What kind of perfection would they have? The Word of God is given to us to understand, to study it, understand it, and live by it. If you don't know what it says, you have a lot of assumptions in your life. And you struggle with failure after failure. Failure after failure. You have a life that, has, that is inconsistent with what you believe. And there's where a lot of Christians live. They have a life that's inconsistent. A contradiction of their faith. And so they have this struggle all the time. You find yourself in that place, struggling with your faith, trying to believe. Trying to make it so. Oh God. My life is such a contradiction. But I believe. But look at me. What is the problem? I'll tell you what the problem is. Believing and faith are not the same. We don't walk by believing. We walk by faith, not by believing. 
So they have a frustration all the time because they believe. And they want to see the manifestation of their believing in their work, in their life. But it's a contradiction. So they challenge God. Oh God, your word says this. Now they make him the scapegoat, you know. Your word says this. Because we're told, take him at his word. They don't understand taking God at his word. Your word says this. And so why is this? And when you say that, God will say, that's the question I'm also asking you. I want to know why. There's a difference between faith and believing. For most of them, they believe. But faith is a different thing. So because they believe, they are mistaking their believing for faith. And so the situation persists. So they are worried and troubled. God, why? Why is it taking so long for this thing to change? Maybe it's in their finances. Maybe it's in their health. Why is it taking so long for this thing to change? I believe. What's the problem? The Bible says, we walk by faith. He didn't say we walk by believing. We walk by faith, not by believing. To believe is to accept that something is real or that it is so. It is to endorse the existence of something. Whatever it is. You accept it. That is believing. Okay? Now, faith on the other hand is acting as though it is so. You see the difference? And to act as though it's so, the word tells us, it means to think as though it's so, because you believe, to talk as though it's so, and to act as though it's so. It says, we also have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Can you see that? So it is the step beyond believing. When you have believed, it says, we believe and therefore have we spoken. We believe. And therefore, you see, it's the result of it. So don't say, I believe. If you believe, then do what your believing has made you believe or made you have. A believer is a haver. You believe and you have. I ask people, if you've been in some of the, the conferences, I say, when you believe in Jesus, did you get anything? And I've asked ministers, and sometimes, you know, they scratch their head and just, they realize that they never thought about it. I said, so you've been preaching many years. You never thought about it. The Bible says, whosoever believeth, hath. So I say, when you believe, did you get anything? And they never thought about it. The believer got something. What did you get when you believed? He that believeth hath. When you believed, what did you get? You say, I, uh, well, I received eternal life. Did you? You see, you probably, you probably didn't. Or if you did, something went wrong. He that believeth hath. Okay. If he that believeth hath, are you he that believeth? If you are, it means you got something. What was it you got? The first thing is eternal life. That's what you'd say. Oh, if you got eternal life, you got it all. What else do you want? What does that mean? It spares eternal life, spares death. 
to every virus that comes to your body. It spares death to every germ that attacks your body. It spares death to every evil that comes into your body. So what are you trying to do when you ask to be healed? You see, you don't believe. See, because the believer has. It says, he that believeth hath. What did you get when you believed? What did you get? You see, many have never been taught that they got something when they believed. So, they have their lives, you know, going around in circles. They weren't taught. So, if when you believed, you had eternal life, you received, he that believed hath. If when you believed, eternal life was truly imparted to your heart, to your spirit. Imagine that some disease attacks your body. What should you say? What should you do? What should be your response? If it is true that you have eternal life, what does eternal life mean? Will you see it as as a trial? Who is trying you? Will you see it as a temptation? Who is tempting you? The Bible says, God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man with evil. So who is tempting you with this problem? Who is trying you with this problem? Now that you have received eternal life. It's not a trial. It's not a temptation. Do something about it. This is your garden. Do what Adam failed to do. When Satan came into his garden, the Bible says, you are God's husbandry. You are God's garden. Your body is like your garden now. So if Satan shows up, what are you going to do? You're just going to let him have his day and cry to God? Don't do that. Believe in what you got. Believe in what you got. Believe in what you got. I heard a story about an old woman. She had been sick. For a while, the young man of God came into her house and expounded the scripture to her. And she was getting it, getting it, getting it. And finally, the young man explained that it's like a serpent coming into the house and running rampage in the house. What will you do? Because it's like this devil's coming to your body and trying to weaken and destroy your body and the woman's thinking. And he said, and if this serpent is moving around in your house, what are you going to do? She said, my God, I'll kill it. Right away, she jumped out of her bed, shouting, the devil is out, the devil is out. And she had been sick for so long. She kept running all over the place. The devil is out, the devil is out, the devil is out. And that's how she walked out of her sickness that she had had a long time. Somebody had to explain it to her. That it wasn't God. She'd been crying, thinking her dying day was coming. Maybe, and maybe then she was dying because she was expecting that this was going to be the result and she was dying. Until somebody let her know. No, you don't have to die. Jesus already did everything. And now the devil is trying to steal from you what God already gave you. And it's up to you to let him take it. Or you choose to send him out. And she said, I'll send him out. So, that's the way you do the devil. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Learn the difference between faith and believing. 
All right? The believer has something. Faith puts it to work. All right? One of the ways of knowing that you are not putting your faith to work is when you start questioning why something has not changed. With God already said, you're God. If this thing hasn't come, you're wondering why. That is indicative of faithlessness. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for and it is the evidence of the unseen. Faith is the evidence of the unseen. Faith doesn't question why healing is not coming. Faith knows that he has what God says he has. And he doesn't say, well, I know I have it, but I am feeling different. No, faith doesn't focus on his feeling. Faith insists the devil is a loser, and I have what God says I have. Stands on it. Stands on it. That's what he does. If you look at the mirror and you say, I'm a success. Oh, boy, I'm going to work to make it happen. I'm a success. You know, if you don't have the air of success, it can't come to reality. Successful people make others successful. If you're a success, it'll come out of your spirit. And those around you become successful as well. But a dull, failing individual saddens everybody else and makes them failures. Say, I'm not a failure. failure. I'm a success. I'm I'm cheered up all the time. Cheered up all the time. 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 Because I'm a success. Yeah. Okay. Did you notice I preached a little bit for you? Did you notice? Yeah. Stay of faith. Glory to God. All right. Now, so I said perfection. Did I tell you perfection? Perfection. Perfection is important. Perfection. 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 Oh, dear Lord. I like it. You know, when you talk about perfection, that those who don't want to hear it, and they say, oh, did you know that those who generally accuse others of being perfectionists, you ever hear them? Those who accuse others of being perfectionists always use that word negatively. Is that right? They always use it negatively. Because they think to be a perfectionist is unacceptable. Why should you think of being perfect when nobody can be perfect? You're asking for too much, they think. You can't be perfect. And yet, when you study the Word of God, in no place does He even suggest to us the impossibility of perfection. He doesn't even suggest it. And He doesn't give us a chance to not be perfect. Everything about God calls for perfection from us. Not when we get to heaven. Not at the rapture of the church. In our life. The reason most people are not perfect is because they don't even know what perfection is. And hear this. And get it into your spirit. It's very important. You see, as I told you about success, success is measured at different stages of your life. Perfection is also measured at different stages of your life. Success is measured according to purpose. Okay? Purpose and goals. Perfection is measured according to light. According to instruction. According to information. That's how perfection is measured. He measures your perfection according to what you know. 
So, become perfect by reason of what you know. Hey, look at this. Have you ever seen these guys that do some of these stunts? You've seen them, all right? Imagine a guy that's walking on a pole as narrow as this one, and it's probably some, uh, maybe some 12 meters from the ground. And he's walking on it. He has to be perfect. If he falls out of that thing, probably certain death. Or he might get himself injured for the rest of his life. Tell him that he doesn't have to be perfect. He believes in perfection. Imagine that you are in a plane, like many of you, you know, when you're traveling, and you get into your BA, and or, or you're traveling to some other country. And while you're inside, and they announce fastness and bears, and you're... And then you hear the sound from the microphone. Uh, the guy says, uh, I'm Captain John Smith. As you know, nothing is perfect in this world. <laughs> Our airplane is no different. No one should expect any perfect landing. It is our hope that we arrive at our place of destination, God willing. What would you think? You'd wish you heard him before they shut the door. If you had heard him before, they, you'd have been out. But now the door is shut. And you start tonguing. You pray to us. Why? Because they believed in success before they brought that plane there. Why is it that only church people don't believe in success? We come into church and we say, well, no man, no man is perfect. You don't have to be perfect. We just keep striving for it. We hope that one day we'll become perfect. Why do we do it in church? Believe in perfection. And don't be intimidated by it. You will not be judged by another person's standard. You will be judged by your standard. So don't be afraid. Okay? Your perfection will be judged according to the information given to you. The information you have received. The training you have received. Not the one you didn't get. So believe in perfection. Talk perfection. Think perfection. That's the way to do it. And guess what? You become perfect. Okay, let me show you something. Would you turn into 2 Corinthians chapter 13? 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Have you found it? Verse 11. I want you all to read it. Read. Read again. Okay, read Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. Want to go.
Good. Stay tuned. Pastor Chris will be right back. Launch yourself today into a whole new world of inspiration and insightful teaching of God's Word as taught by Pastor Chris Oyakilome simply by downloading and using the all-new Pastor Chris Digital Library app. The Pastor Chris Digital Library app grants you access to a wealth of life-changing audio and video messages right at your fingertips, spanning across various topics such as healing and health, faith, Christian living, prayer, fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and much more. Pastor Chris Digital Library app is available now for the iOS and Android devices. Download yours now and get the free message by Pastor Chris, which is available for a limited time. God bless you. The word perfect that you have in both verses originates from two different words, two different root words. Jesus said, be ye therefore perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And the word comes from teleos. Teleos is a perfection in state. All right? When Jesus used that word, he was talking about Perfection in states. And that means perfection in your heart. Okay? Now, Tullius has several other applications that are not immediately applicable in this verse. So here in this verse, he was referring to being perfect in your heart. A perfection in states. A state of perfection in your heart. The way he wants you to think, he says, think like your father thinks. Think the way God thinks. Like he wants you to love the way God loves. So he says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. In other words, measure your heart with the heart of God. And how can you measure your heart with the heart of God? It is through his word. Think as God wants you to. Love as God wants you to. Forgive as God wants you to forgive. These were all the things that Jesus was teaching. How our heart should be like the Father's heart. So he says, be therefore perfect. Tell us, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, the other scripture that you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11 Where he says, finally, brethren, farewell. This was in conclusion of his letter to the Corinthians. And then he says, be perfect. The word is karatizo. It means to do things perfectly. See that? To do things perfectly. Here he's talking about perfection in your actions, in the things you do. Now, this has nothing to do with teleos, which also refers to maturity, which tells us to come to perfection. And in that meaning, we should come to a level, a place of maturity. That's not what he's talking about. Here he's talking about what we do. How we do what we do. That's why the word karatizo is chosen there. He says, Do things perfectly. Is it possible to be perfect in these things? Emphatically, yes. If you're writing a letter, write it perfectly. Do things perfectly. How can we do things perfectly? By paying attention to details. Paying attention to details. Paying attention to details. He says, be perfect. You see that? Now, don't let anybody cheat you out of God's best. 
and tell you that you don't have to be perfect. Well, the Word of God says to be. The Word of God says to be. Be perfect. If you want to be perfect, you can be. And you better want to be perfect because he told us to. Be perfect. Jesus said, if thou must be perfect, then do this. Which means there are other steps. If you're going to be perfect, there are more things to do. How are we supposed to know whether anything is wrong? By seeing. Did you hear me? We train to see. The problem is that there are those who don't see. And in any society, when you're led by those who don't see, Jesus said, Everybody will fall into the ditch because the blind is leading the blind. The blind is leading the blind. Why should an architect go to school and spend so many years learning how to draw lines and curves? Because he's trained to see. An engineer, why do you spend so long? Why don't they just take you straight and start showing you the metals and say, take this one, put it here, take this one, put it here, and it will work. But that's what you thought they should do. Say, I want to be an engineer. You prefer to just be all like those who say they want to be doctors. You like them to take you straight to the hospital and say, now, when they have stomach pain, give them codeine. <laughs> Did you ever have a mom that knew better than the doctors and how to treat anybody? <laughs> My mom knew everything about any sickness and she could treat anybody. Her room had all the drugs. If you complained of anything, mommy knew exactly what to give you. Until the day she gave my sister something strange. And my sister started having, let me not tell you the word first. She was hysterical. And she was talking like a mad person. And I came from school. And they put her on the bed. And my mom was wondering what to do. So they said, let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. And you know what she said to me? The moment she saw me walk in, she said, Christian, if I die, raise me up. <laughs> she was determined she was not going to die. And she had been saying all kinds of things. Just, if I die, raise me up. So we stood there praying. I didn't know what to say, so I was speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues and speaking in tongues and speaking in tongues, and the Spirit said to me, hallucinations. Now, I had never known up till then the meaning of the word. So I ran out of the place, went quickly to, to my room, got a dictionary, and started reading the meaning of the word hallucinations. And I read there that it could be caused by uh, an excess amount of drugs. So, now they got a real problem. 
So I came back into the room. See, we were praying. And it's one of those things that speaking in tongues can do for you. I told you I was speaking in tongues and, and, and brought forth this word, hallucinations. So I came back to the room and I asked my mom, what drugs did you give to her? And my mom said, the normal drugs. I said, can we look at what you gave? So she hurried and got the drugs. And as she read, she realized that instead of 50 grams, she had wanted her to get um, well quickly, so she gave her four of them, and these four, each one was 250 grams. Can you imagine that? So she just went wild and started talking. Like she lost her mind. And you know, for many sicknesses, they say before the person dies, they, they just, first of all, you lose the mind. Then, then. So, um, I think my mom realized she was not a doctor from then. So here's my point. Perfection is something you should consider as necessary in your life. Choose to be perfect. The Word of God says to you. And so now you have to stop accepting all the doctrines of we are not perfect, nobody is perfect, nobody else, blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, in everything else, we want to be perfect. You're going to be perfect. How? The question now would be, how can I do it perfectly? Because you have chosen to do it perfectly. It's going to be perfect. If it's coming from you, it's got to be perfect. It's coming from you. It's got to be perfect. You make a choice, a necessary choice, because we are requiring it of you too. <laughs> I hope you got that. Yeah. We're requiring it of you. It's got to be perfect. The imperfections of systems have led to the death of many people. So why won't you do so much to become perfect? And like I said, leadership is seeing. There's too much of, uh, you know how, how I look at um, the, the African mentality? Can I tell you how I look at it? It's all is well that ends well. You know what that means? All is well that ends well. No. All is not well because it ended well. You find out all the problems that you encountered during the process, investigate them and deal with them and ensure that they don't happen next time. We need to realize that we cannot apologize for a poor job when you are on the global stage. Understand that what we do is at a global level. Okay? So we shouldn't function at a lesser quality. We shouldn't. Your understanding matters. Let me give you an example. We say we are in the world, but not of the world. Is that correct? What's Jesus telling us? That in a world of darkness, you can live a life of light. Correct? 
in a world of sickness, you can live a life of health. Right? You can be an oasis in a troubled world. Correct? That's what it's telling you. You're in this world, but you're not of this world. Right? Okay. Why can't we have the same thing in all we do? It's simple. It's very simple. Raise your standards. Raise your standards. Don't condescend to the level of failure. Don't. Don't acclimatize to unacceptable standards. Raise your standards. Think bigger than your environment. Think bigger than your environment. Raise your standards. You don't raise your standards? Raise your standards. It starts with your mind. You make a decision. And then you choose to, to be perfect. You choose to be perfect. See, if it's going to come from you, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. You get it. That's the way it should be. See, you come to that point where you're you're known for wanting it right. How close do you want to be in doing what you do the best way? You realize you will not move to another level until you become perfect in one level. With God, men may move you, but you'll be a poor Specimen. So, don't agree with all is well that ends well in your work. Okay? Don't say all is well that ends well. No. If things didn't go right, make up your mind to fix them. If thou must be perfect, do these things, right? You ready for that? You're taking steps onto perfection. You want to do whatever you want to do perfectly. Perfectly. You have to learn to attain to details. Okay? Attain to details. Attain to details. And when you start paying attention to the details like that, the people that work under you will learn to pay attention to the details as well because they can see the things that you are concerned about. So I get amazed that you would get a job done, something so nice and so poorly managed. So poorly managed. How could you manage so poorly? Now, if you want God to commit more assets into your care, you must manage whatever has been committed into your care properly.
To purchase other inspiring messages by Pastor Chris, you can download the Pastor Chris Digital Media Library app to your Android or iOS device from the Google Play Store or the Apple Store. You can also log on to www.ChristEmbassyOnlineStore.org or visit any Christ Embassy bookstore near you. Thank you.